of the um, 10 years that I have spent in Africa, four of those years, a year each time, I walked up and down the southeastern coast of the continent 1,500 miles during each of those wonderful years, working with storytellers, historians, and poets in the oral traditions of the Xhosa, the Zulu, the Swati people, and in the southern part of Zimbabwe among the Ndebele people. These are absolutely life-changing experiences. I never used a car. I walked everywhere. I used no translators. And over the years, I collected some on, on tape and on film something like 10,000 oral stories, histories, and poets from that part of the continent. A footnote, the University of Wisconsin Madison uh, Memorial Library has just completed a two-year project in which they have digitized all of my, uh, uh, my stories, my tapes, and my film. So that people who never got much, much further than 20 or 30 miles from their homes can now be seen around the world on the internet. And I love that. It's dusk. I'm walking along a path along the Indian Ocean with my tape recorder, going to a, um, a beer party. I've been told that there would be storytellers there. As I'm walking along the path, a woman comes along. I'd never met her before, tall, imperious. She introduced herself, said she understood I was interested in stories. Would I like to hear a story from her? We sat down alongside the path. I turned my tape recorder on, and she told a story that took an hour to tell. Not stories idly linked together, but one glorious, unified story. From then on, wherever that woman was, I was there wanting to collect her repertory of stories, and I did collect her repertory of stories, and over the years I went back, the next time I went back I again worked with her. She had become the closest friend I have ever had. The third time I went back to do my research, I was going to work uh, further north among the Zulu. She was at Xhosa. Her husband had died of tuberculosis since the last time I was there. She was just coming out of her mourning period when I arrived in South Africa. So I went to stay with her during the last two weeks of her mourning period. When her mourning period was over, she, canny woman that she was, knew that she was going to destroy my Zulu research project. She wanted me to come back the following morning. She was going to tell a story, she told me, that I, that I had never heard before. So the story was to begin at 10 o'clock in the morning. I had never heard a story begun at 10 o'clock in the morning before that Xhosa have a tradition that if you tell stories in the daytime, you're going to grow horns. And the reason, of course, is to keep the kids from bugging the parents to tell them stories when the kids should be doing their chores. But storytelling, I learned for adults, takes place at all times of day or night. So 10 o'clock in the morning, she was then around 65 years old. In her audience were seven women and two men of her age, and then the audience waxed and waned as time went on. She explained to everybody that the story that she was about to tell, she had heard as a teenager at the feet of her great aunt. She had heard it in bits and pieces, told it in bits and pieces since then, and she wanted to tell it once more before she died, pointing out that her grandchildren were no longer interested in the oral tradition, and she wanted me there to tape it for posterity. She also explained that uh, men were by and large the creators of, of, the, uh, of epics among the close-up, this story that she was going to tell dealt with the origins of Xhosa society in epic form from a woman's point of view. So her heroes were women. She started to tell a story at 10 o'clock in the morning. Four hours later, we took a break, came back in the evening. It went on for three hours. The first time I ever heard a story continued into the next day. I really got religion that night, everybody. I prayed that nothing would happen to this woman. The story was magnificent. The next day, it went on for six hours. The next day, for five hours. And on and on she went for 21 days. 21 days. This woman performed one story. Now, when it was over, it was 150 hours long. Consider, if Homer would have created, created the Odyssey in a single sitting, it may have taken him 35 hours. This was magnificent. 
She was a doctor, so she had to be away seeing to her patients for four of those days. So 17 of the days were actually performance days. It was glorious. But that's only part of the story. That was in July. She invited us all to come back the following October for part two <laughs> of what she considered a three-part Closa epic. My Zulu research project went up in flames. There was no way I would miss this. The following October, part two, 150 hours, and then the next month, November, about 100 hours. So that the final epic amounted to something like 450 hours. And I thought I would tell you that story this evening, everybody. <laughs> She was magnificent. She died in 1985. She was deeply aware of her abilities. She was absolutely the most magnificent storyteller I have ever met, and I had met many hundreds of them. I did everything that I could to make sure that this woman would never die. Uh, I have hundreds of, of slides, motion pictures. I have all of her stories, that she, at least that I was aware of, on tape. Uh, and, uh, and I think that long after the oral traditions have passed into history, this woman will still, uh, will still live. My experiences in Africa altered me completely. When I first went to Africa to teach, I taught in Uganda uh, in from 1961 to 1963. Uh, it was the beginning of, uh, of independence in Uganda. Uh, they needed a, a, a 150 American teachers and 150 British teachers to teach in the schools because the colonial British had not done a very good job of preparing the people for independence. I taught in a tiny little boarding school. There were three teachers. The uh, British headmaster hated me. Um, I had a very strange philosophy that African children were capable of learning things and didn't have to memorize everything in, in sight. It changed me completely. I tell my students that whatever happens in their lives, they must be prepared to seize the moment. I had no idea that Africa would then play such an incredibly important part in my life. Before I went to uh, Uganda, I, was in, I did my BA and MA in English uh, literature. I was interested in the old Anglo-Saxon oral traditions. Now, when I came back after two years in Uganda, I wanted to shift because I, I, I had I had heard stories in Uganda. I was aware of how really rich the oral tradition in, in, uh, in Eastern Africa is. So when I came, came back to the United States, I wanted to shift uh, uh, majors from uh, English to African languages and literature, which brought me to the University of Wisconsin in Madison, which had and has the only degree-granting Department of African Languages in, uh, in the country, one of the few outside Africa. My friends in South Africa cannot believe that a landlocked uh, university like the University of Wisconsin uh, could have such an incredible international uh, set of international uh, courses, but, it, uh, but of course it does. So I came back here, and um, I was going to go back to Uganda uh, to do my research, but Idi Amin had come into power, and uh, the State Department would not allow uh, Americans to go to Uganda for this period of time. But something happened to me here at the University of Wisconsin. I came into contact with one of the most extraordinary human beings I have ever met, a Tosa writer, one of the great South African writers, A.C. Jordan, who was an, in political exile from apartheid South Africa. He could never go back, and did never go back. He died in 1968. He is buried here in Madison. He taught me my first African language. Over the years, I learned eight African languages that I worked with in Southern Africa, not much when you consider that there are 2,000 mutually unintelligible languages in Africa. But it was enough to get me around. So he taught me my first African language and got me interested in South Africa, which I was not interested in because it was the very depths of apartheid. I wasn't eager to go into South Africa. He insisted that I do so. It was the best decision I had ever made because I made so many friends and learned so much and became aware of the incredible oral traditions in, uh, in Southern Africa. Anyway, everybody, the big thing is this. When I went to Uganda to teach, I was a teacher. Uh, I taught English. I taught history. I think I was pretty good at it. But there's no question in my mind that I was the, the real beneficiary. 
It changed me. It had an effect on me, an effect that I could never equal on them. They, they, were, they were wonderful to me, and in their wonderful treatment of me, they changed me, they deepened me. And that's what the experience did for me, and it was wonderful, and I recommend it to anybody, young or old. Thank you very much.